In this episode, we continue our celebration of Forgotten February as we talk about a new topic in the world of forgotten 80s toys. So, stick around. and dorkettes and welcome to nostalgia syndrome my name is rob and in this episode like i said we will be covering a new topic in regards to forgotten toys this time around we will be talking about forgotten 80s board games and more specifically board games that were based on movies and to be honest i'm shocked that some of these got board games i mean it's not to say they were bad movies but I didn't think that there was any tie-ins at all with some of these. And I really wish I would have known at the time because some of these were classics from when I was a kid and some of them I still regard as classics. Now, of course, some people see them as industry disappointments, but who cares about that? If you enjoyed watching them in front of your TV, you know, with a VHS tape that your parents got from the mom and pop rental shop and you have fond memories of those experiences and just so happened that the movie you also have fond memories of, that makes it perfect. So it doesn't matter what the critics or anyone says. To me, most of the movies on this list are classics and I'm sure you will agree on some of them. Anyway, Without further ado, let's get to the first forgotten board game that is based on a movie. Our first board game is from the movie Dragon Slayer, and it was released by Simulations Publications Inc., or SPI. The game was released in 1981, and for as much as I love this movie, I'm shocked that it got merchandise and... I had no idea that it existed. I absolutely loved this movie as a kid, but to be honest, I only really tuned in when there was dragon action on the screen. Either it be the creepy baby dragons eating the princess or their super awesome mother, Vermithrax Pejorative, who in my opinion is still the best dragon ever on screen. Yeah, I mean, of course, as I've gotten older and I've watched this movie, which I have dozens of times, I actually have grown to love the story itself, not just the awesome dragon action. Anyway, like I said, this board game was released in 1981, and Simulations Publications, Inc., at that time, was producing different publications for the war game community and they were publishing dozens of war games themselves. Unfortunately they folded in 1982 and TSR acquired all their different properties and rights and kind of kept the doors open until 1987. Anyway, on to the game. Of course, I cannot find a ton of info about it, but I will read what the back of the box has, and we'll take a look at what knickknacks are within the box. Okay, let us read from the back of the box. In Dragon Slayer, you are a magician embarked on a quest to destroy Vermithrax Pejorative, the last dragon. So I guess you are playing as Galen. Okay. Before you confront the Dread Beast, you must travel throughout the island kingdom of Erlin in search of companions, magical items, spells, and weapons. Your journey will be eased or hindered by events that occur along the road, and your every step will be dogged by the king's men. Desperate men 
who would take you captive to thwart your mission. And should your good fortune and skill see you through all the dangers of the road, the greatest peril yet awaits you. You must face and match the awesome creature you have sworn to destroy before you can win, before you can claim the title Dragon Slayer. Says Dragon Slayer is an easy to learn adventure for two to four players of all ages. In two to three hours, you can play a game through to its exciting conclusion. And if you fail to slay the dragon once, you will be sure to try again, because no two games will be alike. The unexpected lurks in every town and hamlet of Dragon Slayer, and you never know until you face the fearsome creature how great a hero you can be. Within the box, you get a large map of the island of Erland, and it looks like what you do is, with all these different cardboard tiles that it comes with, you place them randomly upside down across the map. So as you travel along the map, you're going to hit different obstacles or magic items or the king's men, things like that, that will pop up. And like it said on the back of the box, no two games would be alike because of that. I mean, sure, I would have liked more, you know, maybe little plastic men, but it looks like you have characters for Galen and stuff on these little cardboard tiles. All the different characters that were in the movie actually appear on these tiles, so that's pretty cool. Honestly, I don't know how the game is even played. I mean, I'm kind of guessing from some of these pictures that were posted of what the game setup looks like on the map and stuff like that and, you know, what different tiles and stuff are in the box. But I would be interested in picking one of these up simply because it's Dragon Slayer. I mean, like I said, I love the movie. I st still watch it, and it has awesome box art, so it would be a great display piece. But anyway, since there's not really a lot of info to go by, we're gonna leave it there and head over to number two on the list. Our second board game comes from the 1980 superhero movie, Superman 2, which in my opinion is the best of the Superman movies. Why? Because it has General Zod. It's great to see Superman have foes that are just as strong as him. That's what makes the movie great. I mean, in the first movie, his two biggest threats were Gene Hackman as Lex Luthor and Time. Time itself, which, yeah, that's a topic for another episode. But anyway, this game was put out by Milton Bradley in 1981. This looks to be your typical board game of the time. You know, a fold-out board, very beautiful, very colorful, it pops, it features pictures from the movie of Superman, Lois Lane, and the three villains. And the gameplay sounds a little odd and we'll talk about that in a second but your counters in this are four cardboard cutouts of superman featuring artwork from the comic very cool now this game comes with your four counters your board game a deck of cards and one die and what the point of the game is is to go around the board and capture all three of the Kryptonian villains, while also getting 24 power units and gaining entry to the Fortress of Solitude. But then after all that, you have to guess correctly the mystery villain that's on one of the cards. I mean, it seems pretty convoluted. Just collecting the three villains and heading to the Fortress of Solitude should be enough, but why throw in this mystery card thing? I mean, I'm sure it was fun, especially in 1981, but this is classic looking. Like I said, very colorful game board, and I just love the photos from the movie that they put on. And those same photos are actually on the box itself and the inlay inside the box. So it has a very good continuity of marketing, if you will. 
anyway, like I said, my favorite of the original Superman movies. Heck, I'll just go out and say my favorite of all the Superman movies. Who am I kidding here? This was a classic. Our third board game comes from a movie that was critically panned at the time. And a lot of people still bag on this movie. But to me, in 1980, when it was released, it was perfection. The movie is Popeye, and the game was released by Milton Bradley in 1981, just like the Superman 2 game. Honestly, I loved this musical adaptation of Popeye. Robin Williams, perfection. I mean, to this day, I'll hear one of those songs randomly pop up, and I'm whisked away of being a kid sitting in front of our little TV watching the VHS tape. I mean, I loved it. But anyway, this board game looks awesome to me. I mean, it features photos from the movie. It's actually a 3D board where you have to build out a little cardboard building and it has like a backdrop of you know the fisherman's wharf type scene from the movie it has little cardboard cutouts of robin williams as popeye that you you know use as your markers across the board now i can't find a lot of photos or a lot of information so we'll take a look at what the back of the box says is the gist of this game now the back of the box says Calamity strikes the peaceful coastal village of Sweet Haven. Little Sweet Pea has been kidnapped by the very big Bluto. You can rescue Sweet Pea by moving your Popeye pawn along the path on this three-dimensional game board, looking for Sweet Pea chips along the way. The chips are located in three circles on the game board. Each circle is guarded by Bluto. To collect the chip, you must first own a spinach card, then outwit Bluto by matching the color space in the circle with the color space on the spinner. Whoever collects three different colored sweet pea chips and brings them back to the wharf first wins the game. The path is beset with tax cards that you can both help and harm your rescue attempt. So plot and plan each move carefully have fun. I mean, that sounds like a pretty typical game at the time, and I really like this little 3D wharf thing that it's got going on. And, I mean, it's got a spinner and not die, and I mean, it looks pretty typical for the time period. And I think I'm only saying that it's typical for 1981 is because someone left a review here and said it has a complicated setup with the 3D Worth elements. Plus, simplistic choices like get a tax card, spinach for you, no spinach for you, all based on the color spun, make this a forgettable addition to the growing list of Popeye-themed board games. Now, can we be honest here, folks? How many Popeye board games have you seen out on the market? Is it really a growing list? I highly doubt it. And it's Popeye after all. Why shouldn't it be simplistic? I mean, this was made for a kid's movie in 1981. How hard do you want it to be? And granted, setting up a cardboard box on a game board you found complicated. So how much harder do you want the game to be? Anyway, yeah, for some reason this really ticked me off because, like I said, I'm a fan of the movie and I still view it through nostalgic goggles and enjoy it. Yes, I know this Robert Altman directed movie is bashed by pretty much everybody, but it means a lot to me and, you know, my childhood. So it gets a pass and I can see the fun that you could probably have with this game. Now our fourth board game comes from a supernatural horror movie called The Keep. The game was released by Mayfair Games in 1983. Now this Michael Mann directed movie was released in 1983 alongside the board game. 
and it was based on a 1981 book by F. Paul Wilson. Now, I have to honestly say, I've never read the book and I've never seen the movie. I remember hearing a lot about it when I was a kid, and I can't comment anything on the movie or the book like I said, but we'll take a look at this game. Now, Mayfair Games was a role-playing game company that I mostly knew about through the DC role-playing game, which I was a huge fan of, like in 1989 when I played it all the time. So let's take a look at what Mayfair brought to the table with the Keep game. Now we're going to read the synopsis that was left on BoardGameGeeks.com and great website, you should check it out. I mean, they have stuff from all over the world and a lot of obscure stuff that they talk about, so top-notch website. Anyway, the synopsis that they have written for the game says, a tie-in to the horror film of the same name, one player controls the evil demon Molossar, while the others have 12 turns to find the hilt, the only weapon that can destroy him. It can be hidden in one of six rooms near the heart of the labyrinth. There are intriguing elements to the game. Molossar starts with 12 servants, but actually has to eat one per turn, reducing his options in terms of blocking the searchers. That sounds cool. Combat is handled by attacked searcher nominating another searcher to play a combat card, which is compared against Molossars. The loser is forced to retreat by the difference in values. If the searcher wins, they pick up a bonus non-combat card. All the searchers have minor special powers and Molossar has a number of one-off special cards he can play in trying to delay them. I mean, that sounds like a pretty fun game. I mean, hiding stuff in rooms, instantly clue popped into my head. But let's take a look at the game board. I mean, that's a pretty nice looking board. I mean, it looks like you could use that for a D&D game. And the pawns are like your old school typical board game pawns. Now, this picture of the cards, that's pretty cool. I mean, they actually have pictures of the characters from the movie on the cards and the demon dude, so that's pretty cool. You have all these cardboard knockout cards and tiles. Very colorful artwork. I really like it. That pops. I mean, I dig that. Here we have a bunch of different cards for the game. And again, that map. I love it. That is an awesome looking map. I mean, you can tell this was made by a company that makes role-playing games. I mean, very nice. So, I mean, never having seen the movie or read the book, looking at what this game had to offer, I think it would be pretty exciting to play. I mean, it sounds like it has a lot of twists and turns that would keep it pretty interesting and fun for a group of people playing it. Our fifth and final board game is from a movie that is a bona fide classic. It was the directorial debut of its director, and it's hard to believe that he came out of the gate swinging with this masterpiece. The game is from the movie The Secret of Nim, and it was released by Miss Brisby Limited in 1982. Now, I don't know how this came about, but naming your company after the main character in the movie is like, I mean, that's top-notch awesomeness. Now, the Miss Brisby thing, a little factoid here. Now, this Don Bluth classic was based on a 1971 novel by Robert C. O'Brien. And that book is actually called Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. The character's name was Mrs. Frisbee. So when they were making the movie, they reached out to Whammo, the owners of the name Frisbee, to ask for permission to use that. They shut it down and said no. So they switched gears and went with Mrs. Frisbee. Now, whammo, how could you be a villain? I mean, who cares if they use the name Frisbee? Anyway, 
I mean, first things first, the box itself is a work of art. And man, I love that font they used for The Secret of Nim. Right there in the center. I love it. And I mean, it's colorful, it just pops, and it's, it's beautiful. Like I said, it's a work of art. Now inside the box, you are also greeted with just beautiful artwork. The game board itself depicts different characters in scenes from the movie, and it looks great. I mean, the pictures are just intertwined with the spaces of the board perfectly. I mean, beautiful. This is one of those game boards that you would, you know, if you were a hipster, you would put in a frame and hang on a wall. This would definitely be one that would earn that. I mean, it has the great owl and everything on it. I mean, awesome. I love it. Now, the game comes with different little pawns or counters or whatever you want to call them, playing cards, and this, I mean, this spinner, I mean, that picture of Nicodemus on there is... Yeah, that is awesome. That's a breathtaking picture of an awesome and slightly creepy character, especially when you're a kid. Him and the Great Owl, I mean, were just beautiful. They were all inspiring, but very scary at the same time. Now the back of the box is kind of odd, actually, what it says. It says, The Secret of Nim Game, based on the original art from the Don Bluth production motion picture. Mr. Ages, the tractor, Dragon the cat, beware of Jenner, the owl, and the rat. Along the path they seek to delay, all players who are headed Miss Brisby's way. I mean, doesn't really tell you how to play the game. I mean, it's a nice little poem. It's rhymy, but I mean, from what we can see, the cards feature different characters and items from the movie. And it comes with the game board, 45 cards, playing pieces, a spinner, and an instruction sheet. Now, we will consult, again, GameBoardGeeks.com for their synopsis, because I can't find much else on it. I mean, I can find different pictures and, you know, it for sale on different sites, but no real info. So. Like I said, here's the synopsis that was written for BoardGameGeeks.com. It says, You are in the shoes of Miss Brisby as she makes her frantic journey to save her home and her children. Based on the movie of the same name, this children's game is full of excitement and fun. The game consists of a board, cards, spinner, and pawns. The board represents the adventures Miss Brisby meets within the movie. Along the board, we will meet with various obstacles. To pass each, you must play a matching card. The first player to reach the finish and play an amulet card is the winner. It says, this game is great for children and only requires the ability to count. Hours of fun for the kids and mom and dad. I mean, it sounds pretty cool. Would have been right up my alley, probably when I was a little bit younger. But, I mean... The beautiful artwork enough sells me on this. I mean, we'll have to see what kind of prices it goes for nowadays. But this would definitely be an awesome, like, collector's piece. I mean, it's from an awesome movie that you never really saw a lot of merchandise for. So that alone, in my book, makes it awesome. Okay, folks, that was five forgotten 80s board games that were based on movies. I didn't really know how to approach the topic of board games. I mean, looking at the boards is awesome. A little rundown on, you know, what the game is is awesome. And talking about what the inspiration is, is awesome. I just hope that they're awesome all jammed together for this episode. So, let me know if board games is something we should continue talking about in different points of the future, or it's something that is kind of hard to talk about. Anyway, if you do drop a comment, please be kind. I'm trying my best here. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please give me a thumbs up. If you got something to say, please leave a comment. A nice one. I love reading them, and I love getting back to everyone. 
And if you're new around here and you enjoyed this episode or any of the others that YouTube is recommending down here, please hit subscribe. And if you hit that little bell icon, you'll be notified whenever there's a new episode. So anyway, until next time, thank you for watching. Keep being rad and stay dorky.